remember being in Mrs Thorpe's class at Albert Road Primary School in Penarth, South Wales. And the class was asked, what would we like to do when we grow up? I said I'd like to be a writer. I never thought I'd actually do it. I never thought I'd actually do anything. I don't think anybody did. And then I became interested in music and a few years later I ended up as a singer-songwriter. But in 2010, the words dried up, disappeared. And all those characters I'd written about for 10 years or so were suddenly left to their own devices. The new characters that I had needed a little more attention. To really explore them and their predicaments, I needed more than the three minutes or three verses that a pop song would allow. So I started to write books, novels, plays, poems, essays. I just love writing. C.S. Lewis once said that we read to know we're not alone. Well, that's why I write. You're never alone when you write, even if you're in an empty room. You take a whole host of characters with you. I write whenever I get a moment to myself, but I'm always thinking about the characters in the book. I'm trying to figure out what they might do next, what their motivations are. That might be while I'm in the car, because I do spend a lot of time on the road. But I like to be around nature when I write. I like to be in the forests or at the beach or the estuary or, or parked up by an open field, somewhere ideally away from people. This is where most of the uh, book was thought out, in this car. This is, um, I spent a lot of time in this car traveling between villages all around Norfolk. It gives me a lot of time to think and uh, think about the characters, think about the, the storyline, the plot. And uh, so yeah, much of the story was thought out here. I don't type while I drive, so <laughs> just in case you're worried. I was really obsessed with New Zealand. I still am, really. I um, I went over there in 2010 and again in 2011, albeit briefly. Um, and it does pull on your heart. It's a stunning place, and it's the most. It's one of the friendliest places I've ever been to. And it got me so, it pulled on my heart so much that I just couldn't let it go. And writing this story has, um, it's helped me exercise those ghosts. Writing novels turned things upside down for me. I had to look at writing differently. With a pop song, you can take a huge idea, such as love, grief, or world peace, and you try to compress it down to three verses or so, and yet still retain the profundity of the concept. With a novel, you might start out with a small idea, and then you have to expand it, open it out like a fan, and reveal its meaning.
The pastoral was an exercise in finding the emotion in history. I did a lot of research on the First World War and the lives of the two main protagonists, composers Rafe Vaughan Williams and George Butterworth. It really seemed to touch a nerve and people enjoyed it, which was a surprise. Nice, but a surprise. Albatross Bay, although only a very short book, a novella, was extraordinarily personal. I went deep into my past, to my childhood memories, and was forced to come to terms with my failures as a father, as well as with my relationship with my own father. I'm really proud of that book. Okay, I'm uh, just on my way to see a friend of mine called uh, Michelle Dana Haywood, who's a fabulous artist, very talented painter. And we've been uh, sort of set up this collaboration where she's going to be painting aspects of my book or using uh, the Havelock House book to create uh, work for her own exhibition and for work which. Uh, will be shown at the book launch later. So, I'm kind of looking forward to it. Oh, I wonder who that could be. Oh, it's a local author, John Lawrence, come in. Lovely to see you. Nice to see you too, because mm. I'm hearty. <laughs> because we're hearty. <laughs> It's lovely down. to catch up with a good friend who shares my own strange way of seeing the world. It's you fun to talk about the absurdities do, of life yeah, and, and over a nice cup of tea. Oh. Earl Grey, of course. So what's the difference between creating for yourself and creating based on somebody else's work? Is it harder? It is. I'll be honest with you, it's easier if it's something that comes out of my imagination because I have a responsibility to, um, not just to create, but to provide something for the creator of mm -hmm. something else. It's from their imagination, and they have a really good idea of how they see it. So, you know, am I going to let them down? Am I, am I going to present something which isn't, their vision or how they saw it um, are we thinking along the same but, but then again you can't think along the same lines because I haven't sat down and thought of that story and that plot and the protagonist and I haven't I haven't got that bank of memories and that sentimentality or you know for New Zealand and I haven't visited those places so it would be really helpful if I could be flown to go there and <laughs> <laughs> do some sketches it would be it'd be helpful to go and see the places but I could never then still see it like John Lawrence because it's it's John Lawrence's baby isn't it it's you know and um, I can adopt the baby for a little while <laughs> and care for it and um, and it will grow into something slightly different yeah. um, but I still need to retain John Lawrence's vision and I'm you know so it's really really hard I don't want to do something really abstract that becomes me so I'm the vessel I'm the messenger April April Ooh. now one of the things that I find really appealing is when we work together it's not necessarily about uh, me telling you this is what I want because what I what interests me is how other people perceive what I create um, rather than just saying here's a picture or here's here's a character paint this character mm. you know 
it's great when we work together and I just say this is what this character's about and, and then you sort of have your mm. that yeah your that would be easier if somebody because it's like a commission mm. so if somebody says I'd like a portrait from this photo or I'd like a portrait from this sitting um, and then you put your own obviously your your spin on it mm -hmm. otherwise everybody's work would look the same everybody's book would read the same um, but yeah it's put me under very interesting pressure mm. because um, I know that you don't want something that's really like an illustration for yeah, a book it's, it's not like a, or a picture I, book is it no or and it's such this isn't a, a, an advert but it is it draws you in the story draws you in um, and obviously you want to turn read to the bottom of the page and turn every page so that's where the responsibility lies that if you did want um, pictures of the characters you know do they look how you see them mm. yeah I mean what I don't want is the great thing about writing a novel is you don't tell people what to think. You guide them and then you, you give them, I think a good writer will, will leave them, the, 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 the reader, the opportunity to, to make up their own mind about A, how they feel and B, what they see. There's also the danger that when you're writing, if you know, description's great, but there comes a point where maybe it gets in the way of telling the story. You know, you um, and and again, you rob the reader in this case of, of his or her imagination. If you've given so much detail about, let's say, a house, you, you describe, I mean, the, the Havelock house, I've described it in certain ways, but I haven't said that. Um, that the coving around the, the room was this colour, that the carpet was that no. colour, that um, it was this kind of couch that was in the living room, it was this kind of, you know, these kind of specific details. You give them the, the bare bones and then they can build the picture but, you know, up themselves. There, there are artists like that and they are technically brilliant, but, you know, for instance with this, it, it wouldn't be so abstract if I did every blade of mm. grass and no. every pebble plus I wanted that sense of um, that you're in a, a car on this road yeah driving I won't say where to because of the, the plot but so you're driving and then when you are in a car whether you've got the window up or down there is you know the foreground is very blurred and the you know the mountains would would be less blurred. The, the, the foreground is the, the bit that you it just goes, doesn't yeah. it? And there's, yeah. there's more detail in, in the in in the background, which yeah. is a nice twist on sort of reality, yeah. isn't it? I'm really interested in is is seeing how you interpret things and seeing mm. how other people interpret what I do. Having been there and seen this, mm. I hope that it not only resembles it a little bit, but 
I, I hope I've done a good job. I hope. I, I didn't like the pyramid that you, you took out. Oh, okay. And, <laughs> and the travel lodge. And the travel yeah. lodge. <laughs> interesting thing is that it was Michelle who uh, really made me realise what my own book was about. A couple of weeks ago I, I stopped over and had a, a coffee with her and while we were planning what to do for this, uh, this collaboration I obviously had to tell her what the book was about, what the story, what happens in the story. And I was convinced that the whole book was about grief, uh, a sort of supernatural tale about grief. And I told her basically the story from start to finish. And when I got to the very end, somehow, some reason, I don't know why, but the words came out of my mouth, so the book is actually about guilt. And as soon as I said those words, I burst into tears. It was a bit, a little bit embarrassing, but it wasn't until that moment that I realised what I'd been writing about and what, and the reason I'd been writing. It was to come to terms with my own guilt. At the heart of my guilt was the relationship with my mother. I was always really close to my mother. She was my best friend for so many years. We used to do so much together and laugh so much. She was the one person who really supported my creative development. But in 2002, she suffered a horrendous stroke. She'd been in hospital for a while, and then one night the doctor said to us, you might want to say your goodbyes. She's not going to make it through the night. So I went to her bedside and I tried to sum up all the love I had for her in a few lines, which is a bit like trying to catch a whale in a fishing net. I didn't know if she could hear me. I just told her that I loved her, that I was proud of her, and that I would see her soon. In my head and my heart, I said goodbye. But Mum didn't die. The massive stroke that she suffered robbed her of her ability to walk, to talk, to contain her emotions, but it didn't steal her life or even her spirit. But I had conditioned myself for life without her. It was as if someone had flipped a switch which would enable me to live life without her. But it flipped too early and I couldn't switch it back. Then I had two children and my life went down another road. I don't see mum as often as I want to, as I should. I suppose that's because when I see her, I'm reminded of how much I miss her, and how much I failed her, and how I'm still failing her now, as no son should ever fail a mother.
finally made it to New Zealand after 33 hours between London and here. I'm back in New Zealand. It was a pretty terrifying flight between Wellington and or between Sydney and Wellington. Uh, Buddy Holly Airlines. I'm sure I heard the pilot whistling in the room by Glenn Miller. But we're here. Finally, made it. in a couple of days, we're going to catch the, uh, the Inter Island of Ferry into the Cook Strait and on to Picton. And from Picton, we'll finally make it back to Havelock. So, what is the story? Well, without giving too much away, Di and Bronnie have emigrated from South Wales to New Zealand in order to rebuild their lives after the death of their son from leukaemia. However, they both quickly realise that even running to the other side of the world, you can never really escape your ghosts. Their relationship begins to deteriorate as they both make the unlikely acquaintances of two children. Di comes upon cheeky little Maori boy Hemi and starts to develop an unlikely friendship, while Bronnie becomes embroiled in a mystery involving Harry, a child she suspects of suffering domestic abuse. Tying all these things together is a fierce but silent Maori man, Ruru, who has a dark history of all of his own. However, nothing in the book is quite what it would seem. It sounds quite dark, but from out of the darkness comes the brightest lights. We just started our journey from uh, Wellington over to Picton on the ferry and I'm hoping it's not going to be too rough because I'm not sure my stomach's going to handle it. Then again if we can handle the trip from uh, Sydney to Wellington on the plane then we'll probably handle anything. Location is everything. It's the unspoken subtext of the book. The New Zealand landscape is stunning, but its massive mountains, smothering forests of ferns and palm trees, its active volcanoes and imposing wildernesses can induce a real sense of perspective, and thoughts of one's own mortality are never very far away. When you stand alone listening to the sounds of the Tui calling, as it has done for millions of years, or when you sail through the beautiful Marlborough Sounds, marvelling at the playful dolphins or the elegant seals, as the descendants of the Maori did all those years ago, you get a real sense of your own insignificance. And with that great expanse, you have time to think. Think about the things you have and the things you've lost. And in that situation, you find yourself on a knife edge. You can either embrace the beauty and the majesty of life, or be swallowed whole by it.
So here we are, we've made it back to Havelock and uh, this is the main town, this is where everything is set in the book and uh, it's a sleepy little place uh, but probably with its own secrets. Um, welcome to Havelock. For years I had the idea, concept and title of the suburban fairy tale. I'm drawn to the idea of two contrasting worlds colliding. Suburban suggests all that is ordinary, mundane, ordered and unremarkable. While a fairy tale is, of course, full of magic, mystery and the remarkable. In that respect, Havelock seems well placed to host its own suburban fairy tale. So this is the kind of setting that uh, we have for the book um, and these are the kind of houses that are scattered all around these Pelora sounds and uh, they sort of protrude out into the, uh, into the skyline, they're, they're stunning places and uh, this is the kind of thing that the Havelock house is. Um, you can just kind of see where this kind of protrude out from um, and I'll show you a little bit more of this house in a minute. And you can see the kind of places where, where Hemi and, uh, and Di told their stories to each other. I do believe that Inspiration comes from within, but it's hard to deny that if you're in a place like this, inspiration is around you as well. It is stunning here, stunning. There's a silence in here, which is similar to the silence that I imagine Di and Bronnie experiencing. It's a real stillness. It's beautiful, but it can be all-absorbing. 
And it's a silence which almost destroyed their relationship in the book. This is the perfect place for writing. It doesn't get much better than this. It's the Tui calling. There's oyster catchers on the shore down here. The sound of the waves just kissing the pebbled shore. Perfect. And uh, this is a place for two people to fall in love. But ironically, this is the place in the book where two people almost fall out of love, blinded by their own grief. Uh, and grief affects people in different ways. In the book, Bronnie tries to just get on with work, while Di tries to deal with Bronnie. But neither of them have dealt with their grief. So this is the kind of garden that I imagined uh, in the book. Sheltered in the hillside, steep steps, and lots of places for a little child to jump out and scare somebody. <laughs> it's secluded, it's quiet, Apart from anything else, it is stunningly beautiful. This has a path which weaves zigzags, should I say, up and down the hillside. Hello, buddy. Hello, mate. Alright. You gonna slobber on me? Yeah, yeah. This is Trev. He's our friendly little dog who's been looking after us. And uh, the kids have been having a, a whale of a time playing with this little this big old creature. And uh, in fact this whole area this whole area is just right for kids for exploring, for, for finding this path and that path and going through these bushes and looking at these animals, possums, tuis, all these kind of things. And uh, it's a real playground, I think, for kids. You've got the boats up, up down the front as well, which the kids have been playing. And it's a perfect atmosphere for, for Hemi in the book. It's a perfect setting for his, his inquisitiveness and his, uh, I don't know, his, his cheekiness. What do you think, Trev? You agree? Yeah? Kiss, kiss. Mm. Oh, good grief. One of the things that really appeals to me as a writer uh, is the idea of a paradox or you know, something which should be one way but is another. Something which is black when it should be white or white when it should be black. You know, for example, in the book there's you know, this, the sad irony of Bronnie and Di sleeping in the same bed, living in the same little house in the hillsides, but being so far away from each other. And as the paradox of, you know, having something as beautiful as this out of your front window, but there's an ugliness within your heart, and that, in the case of Dime Bronnie, is the grief which is tearing them both apart.
do like a mystery. I've always liked mysteries and uh, sort of whodunits. I used to read the Sherlock Holmes books when I was when I was young, and uh, so I like to keep a a reader kind of guessing what might come next. Not always it can't always resolve in a in a happy ending. It's not Hollywood. However, you have to find the emotional uh, side to the story, and at times I've I've found it hard to write. Because I found myself so deeply within the story and connected myself to the, to the characters as I was writing that I realised that all of those characters are an amalgam of my own personality. Whether it's the guilt that Bronny and Di feel at not being able to help their son, whether it's the cheekiness of Hemi or whether it's the anger of Ruru. I've got a bit of all of myself. I've got a bit of myself in all of those characters. And so, you know, there's the, there's the story that's, or the line that's, which Pete Townsend once said, you know, if you don't want anybody to know anything about you, don't write a song. I think it's a little similar with a book. You're bound to give a part of yourself away when you're, when you're writing. But, uh, but that's a, that's a price you have to pay. Writer's block. It's a myth. It's an absolute myth. Ironically, in the book, Di is a writer and he's suffering with writer's block. Um, which, I think Steve Martin once said, is just the term that writers use to whinge and whine and have some more tea and wine. You have to have writer's block. Because you can't always be on output as a writer. There comes a time where you have to say, OK, there aren't any ideas at the moment. There's a reason for that. And the reason is, is that stuff needs to come in. Ideas, thoughts, experiences, they all need to come in. And then you need that time to digest them, find out what you are interested in, think about you know, what's important to you. And, uh, and then, when you're ready, when your brain's ready, it will tell you, Right, now's the time to write. And it might take two or three months, it might take years. As a songwriter, I haven't written anything now for about, or of any real note, for about four years. What are my expectations for this book? well, that people will read it, <laughs> that's the start, and then, uh, and just hopefully people will enjoy the story, it's, it's not a long book, it's quite short, it was very personal to me, and it's brought me back here, to, to see where, or to re be reminded of, of the landscape, the people, and, uh, and to be reminded of why I started writing the book in the first place, which was to get a bit of New Zealand in my veins. I hope you enjoy the book um, as much as I enjoyed writing it. See you soon.
I think I've put the obsession of New Zealand behind me. I think I can move on now. It'll always be in my heart, and maybe one day it will be my home. I've learned so much about myself as a person while writing this book. I've uncovered so many demons within me, but having exposed them, I now feel better placed to deal with them. <laughs>